Hello and welcome to the Innovation Book Club, the podcast that makes sense of the big ideas that drive creativity and innovation. We're your hosts, Alex Drago and Weiss Passard, and we believe that while there's never been a greater need for new ideas, perspectives and solutions, understanding exactly what innovation is and how it works has never been more difficult or confusing. So our purpose for this podcast is clear. In each episode, we take an important text from the innovation field, deconstruct it, and then talk through the key ideas to help you develop a more innovative mindset. Okay, so this week's episode is uh, based around Peter Drucker's theory of the business. And it's an article he originally wrote for the Harvard Business Review in 1994. And really, its value to innovation is a sort of preamble. It's a strategic article rather than the detail of, of delivering innovation. And it's important because it really raises fundamental issues around the purpose of organizations and how that translates through to the direction of the organization, the value you create, and, and therefore what you're doing on a daily basis. Drucker was born in Austria, in Vienna, in 1909, into a liberal middle-class home. His parents were very well-connected. You know, the profound experiences that shape uh, Drucker's life uh, are around the end of the First World War. So at the end of the First World War, the Austro-Hungarian Empire is broken up and obviously huge chaos there. He can't get a job in Vienna. He moves to Germany. He becomes a journalist. He studies law. And then in 1933, he's had enough of the rise of Nazism already, and he moves to, to England. He goes to a lecture by the economist John Maynard Keynes, and Keynes is famous because he challenged the prevailing economic wisdom of the time. So at the start of the Great Depression, 1929, what governments thought you had to do was balance the books like it was your checkbook. And so you had to stop spending you had to raise taxes to cover the black hole and so on and so on. And Keynes was like, no, that's nonsense. That's not the role of government. The role of government is to stimulate growth. And how you stimulate growth is to borrow money on the markets and then spend it through public works. And that will create jobs. That will create spending. It will get money moving. And Drucker realized that they weren't talking about humans. And that's really what he was interested. They treated economics as an abstract concept which of course it is, um, but what Drucker was really interested in was human behavior. And that's really became the focus for his life. And management, the idea of management stems from that. He realizes that for societies to function, uh, you need strong institutions, but to have strong institutions, you need good management. Because if you don't have good management, then tyranny prevails. And that's what he'd witnessed during uh, the rise of Nazism. And in fact, I think a couple of his books are, are on the list that are burned by the Nazis. So that's quite a, a, I suppose, a badge of honor. He moves to America, uh, becomes an American citizen, citizen in the 1940s. And he really dedicates his life to this idea of management theory. And he creates a whole raft of concepts that we take for granted, um, management by objectives, management by performance, executive education. Really, at his heart, he was a sort of humanitarian. His heart was in uh, making stronger communities. And he was the sort of perfect manifestation of his thinking. So he was a consultant, he was an academic, he was a researcher, he was a teacher. Everything that he said, it was a sort of humanity that ran through it, that organizations are about people, they're not about profit. Profit's not the primary goal, but it is the condition upon which businesses actually function. Yeah. But actually service is the what you're actually trying to provide, and management has a very important role in that. During the course of his life, he writes... 39 books, most of which after he'd sort of retired. So in his 60s and 70s and, and beyond, he teaches up until he's in his 90s. He dies in 2005, age 95. His wife, Doris Schmidt, she actually dies age 113, sorry, 103. Wow. 
in 2014. So both of them led very successful, long, long lives. And the theory of the business is published in 1994. What's remarkable is that it's a very short read. It's a very accessible read. It's very clear. It's quite seductive, actually, in his reasoning. Really what Drucker is noting within this article is that he witnessed businesses that used to be star performers and they're now failing. And he's trying to work out why that is happening when everybody's working as hard or harder than they were before. And he thinks, well, it, it can't just be about conditions. It must be something deeper than that. And again, it comes back to the role of management. Sure. Makes sense so far? Yes, definitely. Yes, a clear summary. So the first thing that he notes is that there's a sort of paradox at the heart of businesses today. He says that we have an abundance of tools that are about how to do things. We know how to do everything more efficiently. Uh, what we don't know is we don't know what to do when the environment changes. That is actually what is most important. And he says that what we do is largely the product of a set of assumptions. It's kind of what we would talk about now as, as business culture. And basically, our assumptions are incorrect, so they're no longer match with reality. So a quote from him, he says, these are the assumptions that shape any organization's behavior, dictate its decisions about what to do and what not to do, and define what the organization considers meaningful results. These are assumptions about markets. They're about identifying customers and competitors, their values and behavior. They're about technology and its dynamics, about a company's strengths and weaknesses. These assumptions are about what company gets paid for. These are what I call a company's theory of the business. Any thoughts so far, Weiss? Well, it's interesting that he mentions the assumptions uh, throughout the whole organization. Of uh, throughout the whole organization, it's not only uh, the assumptions of the CEO, but it's the assumptions of uh, the the sales department or even the operations and all the departments within an organization. He's talking about those assumptions also concerning concerning to the theory of the business that's what's interesting about this uh how he approached this yeah yeah it's true it runs through everything i mean when you when you go back and look at those decisions or those assumptions it's about it's about everything you know he says markets customers competitors technology what you can do with technology uh the company's own sort of competitive advantage what you're actually getting paid for and I've been through a couple of restructures yeah. and and what those restructures did was expose some of those assumptions mm -hmm. in terms of how little agreement there was about them, about whether, you know, were the assumptions wrong in the first place or were the assumptions that we wanted to move to wrong? I'm I'm not sure, probably a bit of both. It was certainly a period of great uh, stress and confusion for people. It's definitely recognizable because also in my experience, um, a lot of, uh, many times there were managements, even if they started to question their assumptions, it was the majority of time their assumptions, the assumptions of, of, of uh, two people or three uh, uh, executives done. It wasn't the assumptions about the people who run the operations, the people who run the finance uh, part or the or the logistics part. It was all, or even the, the people who are related to the company outside of the company is not the markets. It wasn't about uh, those also. It was mainly about the assumption of a particular CEO with the assumption that the whole company is based on his assumptions, that therefore we need to, and do some brainstorming or some innovation workshop to to change those assumptions and therefore we can proceed and it's really nice how peter drucker approaches this uh, his theory of business which he relates everything what uh, the what an organization can be related to if if there are some assumptions about uh, the market they, they, it definitely has uh, relations uh, to the assumptions of the company's uh, strategy or the, the mission of the uh, uh, company or whatever it is of the company is all interconnected with each other. That's really nice of uh, Peter, how he approached it. Yeah. I had a boss once, right? She would 
criticize you for not having done things. Right. And, you know, I would say, well, you didn't ask me to do those things. Exactly. <laughs> or I did it in a different way. Yeah. And, and you would say, well, you should have known. <laughs> I'd sit there thinking, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I can't read your mind, right? <laughs> Like a typical example of an assumption that she assumed. <laughs> but fundamentally, she had a set of assumptions about what we should be doing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and his were different to mine. Uh, you know, she was she was not working on the same site that I was, so I was managing a different operation. I was dealing with a different set of customers and so on and so on. But somehow she still thought I should be able to uh, read her mind and therefore interpret, you know, what she really, really wanted. And I suppose that's a very, very basic example of this idea of the theory of the business where there is a mismatch between what's expected by both parties. Yeah, exactly. And within the whole environment, all parties, we could say. The finance people, the executives, what they, what the, the, the assumption they have about the market. And there's a gap between it, which could lead to yeah, not uh, favorable outcomes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so Drucker says that every organization has a theory of a business. And I think it's important to note that he's not just talking about profit-making businesses, you know, companies in the private sector. He, he also talks about governmental institutions, charities, hospitals, museums, you know, even voluntary organizations and so on and so on is that they're, they're really sort of driven by this set of assumptions. And of course, what you need is a clear, consistent and focused theory of the business if, if you really want to accelerate the, the performance of, of the individuals, the managers, and, and of course, the, the performance of the, the whole organizations. True. So he gives a couple of, I guess they're slightly obscure examples, but they do sort of make sense. And he talks about the uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, who founded the University of, of Berlin. The, the profound innovation there was that, oh, we'll get these people to do some research and then we'll teach them what that research is about. And it's hard to believe that that's, you know, that, that was ever an innovation. But obviously, way back in the midst of time, uh, universities were essentially uh, part of a religious institution. Uh, but this example actually lasted for about a century until the rise of Hitler. And then, of course, the politics actually takes over. And during the Cold War, because it's in Berlin, it gets split up and so on and so on. Yeah. Um, but that's really the sort of theory of the of their business. He also talks about a Deutsche Bank. So way back in the midst of time when that was founded. So Germany became a country in 1871 following the Franco-Prussian War. But Prior to that, it had been 30 of sort of principalities, sort of Germanic principalities. And Deutsche Bank provided a set of governance processes and a banking system that allowed these principalities to actually work together. And that's actually what drove a lot of uh, German industrial development. And in fact, it carried on doing that. And it's only in the last 10 years or so since the financial crisis that it started to really, really struggle. All right. Yeah. One that we're more familiar with is IBM. So IBM started as a single-use punch card system. Yes. Then they sort of developed the idea of mainframes, and they thought that in the future, everybody would just plug into a mainframe and all the computing power would actually be centralized in, in, a, in a mainframe. I mean, I know you're a bit younger than me, Weiss, but I'm sure you can remember or you know what a mainframe is. Yes, 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 definitely. <laughs> so so for those visitors who don't know what a mainframe was, I suppose it's a bit like the processing power was so big that it had to be in one location. And then you had a lot of dumb workstations that could access that processing power. And of course, now it's uh, it's the other way around, right? That was the point. Failure in the 70s and 80s was that their theory of the business no longer held true because as Apple and others developed personal computers, it sort of shattered their idea of the theory of the business. Yeah, the environment changed. He also talks about Zeiss, which is a optical equipment and lens company, and their CEO at the time in sort of 1900 said the Kodak box brownie, yeah, small camera innovation, was was nonsense. And then a couple of years later, they actually have to then create lenses for other handheld cameras. Mm-hmm. 
the story, and I suppose in each of these cases, this underlying set of assumptions have changed. Yes, right. Um, I don't know if there's any others you can think of. Well, definitely, it reminds me of uh, Samsung itself. It started as a food uh, company, and now it's <laughs> it's a huge From South Korea now. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's basically around South Korea. <laughs> but yes, exactly. Like Samsung started with as a food company. Now they're even in uh, shipping container manufacturing, weapons industry, mobile phones, which we're, which they're popular from. But it's definitely a, an example of uh, the, the that's, that's um, this business also had a theory of business and eventually changed completely to something else. Yeah. And it's interesting that uh, the, the theory of business, well, uh, the examples Peter gives, it doesn't matter what type of organization you start, it's based in the beginning on a, on, a, on a set of assumptions. And in his example, he clearly shows that the change in environment or, or, or within a company or, by, uh, or with, between customers uh, eventually resulted to a different outcome for the company or the organization you have created. So therefore, there must be something <laughs> not aligned with the reality uh, uh, of the environment, whatever it is. So it really clearly shows uh, the undesirable outcome of of, uh, of market changes or so on. So it's interesting. Yeah, and definitely something reminds me and other companies. I think the majority of startups now nowadays starts with a particular aim and eventually grows uh, towards completely a different. Uh, strategy or the completely different value they deliver to uh, customers. He does raise conditions upon which you should address the the theory of the business. He breaks the theory of the business down into three parts. So he talks about assumptions around environment. You know, what's the society you're working in? How is it structured? You know, what's the market like? Who's the customer? What's the technology you're using? And he says, this is what an organization is actually paid for. Right. And then he says, there are assumptions about the specific mission of the organization. So, you know, what, what we consider to be meaningful, you know, what, what's the point of doing it outside of making their profit? Yeah. And third, assumptions about the core competencies needed to accomplish that particular mission. So that that's, you know, what you need to be good at in order to maintain or, or to grow your, your position within the market. Do you agree with those? Do you think they're a good, a good standard? The, the assumptions about the environment is definitely an, an, an important one because in the exam, previous example he gave, you could see changes in uh, or customer needs or the markets or the technology, it changes. And it eventually the, the, the company didn't perform as they assumed they would perform. So uh, I think definitely the first one, which is assumptions about the environment is an important one. And the other one, which he says uh, the specific mission of organizations. And also in, I could, uh, in the previous examples, he gave also uh, uh, examples of organizations which had a particular or a specific mission uh, and eventually by changes within an environment, uh, society, market, whatever it is, it eventually it, it showed that their mission wasn't aligned to reality and which made them also not perform as assumed. And that's an interesting one. And the third one, definitely the core competencies uh, needed to accomplish the organization's mission is definitely important because um, any organization, the, the, uh, how it's structured eventually definitely has a impact on how it uh, will perform eventually. And if it's not aligned with each other and uh, when, uh, with the, the mission in, in its uh, whole, as a whole, then it's definitely going to uh, create a gap between reality and and uh, and how they perform, how they think they would perform, which could lead to uh, to organizations uh, not performing as uh, as uh, they want to. Which also shows in his previous examples, it's really nice. It's based on all those previous examples. It's interesting that he showed like this. Th these companies have had. Uh, uh, started in this way, they made a lot of profits, and eventually something changed in within the environment, or within their mission, or in the way people believed within their organizations in the mission, or knew about, or were conscious about it. So these are the three main areas which things happened, which led them to 
not perform as they assumed uh, to perform. And it's interesting, however you split up uh, innovation or indeed the business operation, you know, if you're looking at the constituent parts of a business plan or a business model, right, it, it, they all overlap with these, you know, three things. So, you know, you, you, you within a business plan, for example, you're showing what you're actually getting paid for, right? You're showing what, what success looks like and you're showing – you know, what you need in order to um, deliver that. It's, it's a snapshot, basically. And and I, I think it's interesting because it's taken him almost a lifetime. You know, when, when he wrote this in 1994, he was already 70-odd years old. Oh, wow. It's taken him a lifetime in order to distill this into something that's so apparently straightforward. And and that's what I always like about Drucker. It's it's like he's not really a, a guru as such. He, in fact, he rejects the label of guru. You know, people get called gurus because people can't spell the word charlatan. <laughs> you know, he says what what I do is not difficult. I just look, I observe, I I you know I think about it. But the kind of strategic view that you need in order to come to these three particular conclusions and tie them together into a unified theory. I think it's profound. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that. Why? Because I remember strategy uh, workshops uh, at several companies I worked uh, with or in, uh, where they mainly focused on how to create new products or new services, how to change the business model. And Yes, it was based, it was, they considered definitely the changes within a market or something. I have never experienced a conversation or a thought process between executives or about, uh, or what are the assumptions we base our strategy, base our business model, base our uh, operations on. It doesn't say here like uh, the important part of the theory of business is the business model. You have to define it. You have to create a mission or a vision or whatever it is. It says it goes deeper. It goes, I think, in a level deeper, like, okay, whatever you uh, you write down as a mission, vision, or a business model, or whether it's a business model canvas or whether it's whatever canvas it is, it's based on a set of assumptions, which is not only between uh, a handful of individuals on an executive level, but it is based on the assumptions between all the people within the organization, outside of the organization, in the environment, all those assumptions are which makes basically the company perform and the the cha- and it is an interesting that he goes on a deep on the i don't know if, it, if if there is a level deeper than that but it's definitely a level deeper than what what i used to think about as businesses in terms of business models putting a business into a model or describing what the mission vision or the strategy is it's really interesting that he goes a level deeper and shows that the companies or the performance isn't only based on the models we know but it's it's more humane and it's based on the human parts of it which are the assumptions we base our thinking and thought process about those models and strategies and he has four tests to validate your theory of the business, right? Right. The first one is the assumptions about the environment, mission, and core competencies must fit reality. And he gives the example of Marks and Spencers, which which he he labels as the first classless uh, retailer. Now, I don't know. I mean, you lived in the UK. I don't know how familiar you were with Marks and Spencers. I visited it several times. <laughs> So famously good for prepackaged food and women's underwear, apparently. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's this kind of stalwart of the uh, of the uh, high street in in the UK, and it started as a market stall in Leeds, and I think they were two Jewish guys, and what they did was that they started selling stuff for like everything was one price or something like that, like a pound store, right? Or a dollar store, right? But it was their market store. 
but actually what happened was during the First World War, British society changed, right? So the influence of the aristocracy started to become limited because of changes in voting. Mm -hmm. So women could vote and the age to vote was lowered. And also as a result of the First World War, the men were fighting which meant that the women had to come into the factories in order to do the the hard labor, you know, making munitions and supplies and so on. And that led to economic change. So women for the first time were more independent, more empowered and more financially able to do that. And Marks and Spencer's exploited that by asking the customers and saying, well, what do you want to wear rather than, well, we have our contacts with the best manufacturers, and this is what they say you should be wearing. Exactly. <laughs> Quite a profound, you know, profound shift. And actually, what happens in the UK is that every 10 years, Marks and Spencer's goes through another crisis. And it's always about they're old fashioned, they never have what people actually want, and so on and so on. And they're always one like one generation behind and they cannot ever seem to align their theory of the business. And it's hard to think that this sort of ancient high street company was once this fashion classless innovative force. Yeah, it is interesting how in, within the environment, the assumption was exactly like you said, the, the manufacturers are the, were the ones who were, innovating or thinking about products people would need because they were good at making them that was the the the, the basic assumption which Marx and spencer's or probably the whole environment within the uk were based on okay we are going to some manufacturers we're going to buy some a lot of products as a wholesale the wholesaler will sell it to retailers and they would assume okay these are the new products probably or these are the new trends and they would sell it and it's interesting that Marx and spencer's eventually thought okay People are complaining, and maybe we should listen to them. And I don't, I don't know if they have gone through the process of going to with their complaints to the manufacturers, but there's happened something which made them listen to the uh, customers eventually. Like it doesn't work. It doesn't work. The the uh, that's uh, the fact that they just pro- bought products from uh, the manufacturers didn't work eventually, which forced them to think about. Well, maybe not specifically consciously about their assumptions, but they make them uh, listen to the words the uh, customers, which eventually is basically the uh, questioning their assumptions. Okay, now we're used yeah. to going to the manufacturer. Now we're going to listen to uh, someone else. Yeah, and Drucker says it took them the best part of a decade to actually make that shift. Obviously, they don't have the same technological sophistication that that you might be able to do that today so if you think about what zara do right they introduce new garments every two weeks or something like that because the technology allows them to go through that design and manufacturing process but the, uh, at the the start of that was was marks and spencers responding to changes in the environment and then realigning the organization uh, to take advantage of it even if they would have the uh, the technology Zara now you have has, I don't think Marcus Spencer would have been able to uh, achieve uh, achieve what they've achieved after the decade. I think it's it's also based, of course, on the technology they had, but I think it's also based on assumptions that their suppliers, their wholesalers, their manufacturers had, and uh, probably their manufacturer were used that used to. Uh, uh, re- used to receive orders from from market spaces instead of questions or an inquiry about about a new garment or a new underwear of females. Like instead of asking the manufacturers, "Hey, manufacturer, what are new new products you have developed?" Now they are going to ask like, "No, manuf- it I understand why it took a decade because they were probably uh, uh, working with thousands of suppliers." Whereas they all approached suddenly differently. <laughs> Instead of or- ordering products, they started placing orders how they should operate. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Well, that's a shift in the in the relationship. I can't remember what the model's for, but I think we did actually study in that actually instead of the industry shaping what the final product looks like, it's actually the, the intervention by a company that exactly. actually shapes how the market functions. So... If you think about petrol stations, I don't know what it's like in the Netherlands, but in the in the UK, 
most petrol stations now are in supermarkets. So supermarkets are actually dictating to the petrol companies oh, wow. how the market is actually going to work. That, ne- that never would have actually happened before. And so I suppose it was the same with Marks and Spencers that they had built up presumably uh, enough demand to say that, do you know what, this isn't working. Well, what we want is something different and it's going to look like this from now on. That's probably why it took so long because I imagine in the 1920s, everything moved a lot more slowly than it, uh, than it does today. Yeah, true, true. The second condition that he has is that the assumptions in all areas have to fit one another. And he talks about General Motors in the in the mid nineteen twenties and and there. So if you think of Henry Ford, what he did was that he controlled the whole end to end of the manufacturing process. So he even had rubber plants yeah. in different countries and so on and so on. Right. So GM does it slightly differently. They develop an advantage by streamlining the number of car models that they're going to produce, which means that they can have advantages in the manufacturing because of um, economies of scale. Um, and then they're able to allocate a certain amount of capital per car. Well, we know how much it's going to cost. We know what material. Therefore, they're m- much more able to better plan their business. That helps them to grow enormously in fact, every year up until the mid 70s and towards the 80s, where actually um, society starts to diversify and their assumptions don't fit with the, with the wider environment. Right. The third one is the theory of the business must be known and understood throughout the organization. So that's sort of example that I was saying that um, uh, my old boss <laughs> had a set of assumptions. I had a set of assumptions that turned out that they were fantastically (laughs) different from each other. But that's the sort of culture, and that culture is the sort of, I suppose, the soft end. It's the visible end of of that uh, mission statement. The fourth one is there, the theory of the business has to be tested constantly. He says it's not engraven on tablets of stone. It's a hypothesis, and, and you have to keep testing it. And again, I think, you know, last time we talked about the adjacent possible with the Stephen Johnson book, where good ideas come from. And you were saying that what the adjacent possible is never ends. It It's always evolving and growing from generation to generation. And I think he's saying the same thing here about the theory of the business because the world changes, because the technology and the markets change then the theory of the business has to be tested constantly. You can't just say this is the way that it is and goodbye customers. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. Yeah. Society, markets, customers, technology, everything changes. And if a company doesn't test their assumptions, it will provide solutions or value for the customers. doesn't exist anymore, could we say? <laughs> they changed. You know, if you think of the the big businesses that have have failed, it it is because the theory of the business, it no longer fits reality. Nokia. Tell us about Nokia then. Well, Nokia eventually had a theory of business, wasn't smartphones. And eventually when the smartphones took off and yeah, well, they treated themselves as the holy grail company who had the best solution for communication whatever and eventually they didn't they didn't look to their assumptions uh in relationship to the changes in the environment and the customers by the customers and the technology which was rising which eventually led them to almost yeah go bankrupt completely and but they weren't anymore in the telecoms market dominant anymore and also i think it, uh, it was the similar case with kodak yeah, and their their assumption is that photographs were to be printed out and shared. You need a physical copy of the photograph. And actually, the paradigm shifted is that you share it because the technology on your phone allows you to share it. Exactly. Yeah, and the interesting point within this for specifications of the theory of business of a drucker is that it says as if companies uh, create a product or a service, they're outperforming other companies, they become a leader, and suddenly they assume that this is the solution for a particular problem, and they assume that this is going to be the solution for the upcoming 100 years or something. This is the holy grail product, this is the holy grail service. And on one side, if I'm not talking about it, I'm like, that 
that sounds crazy because if I would make a product, I wouldn't say that this is a hundred years the, the solution for a particular problem. But it's interesting that in corporate companies, it's so big and suddenly you have a particular power product and they're making billions of do- uh, dollars. For example, instead of me making a mobile phone case and it would earn a few thousand euros on it and I would say, yes, definitely, this is a good one. But I understand, I think, that if my phone case would suddenly make $4 billion in revenue, that if somebody would come to me, like uh, question me, like why is question your assumption because the market is changing, nobody is going to use uh, phone cases. I would understand uh, why a certain executive would say, no, 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 what do you think? Are you crazy? This is making $4, million, $4 billion in revenue. How could this possibly go down? <laughs> <laughs> but historically, Peter Drucker, and also uh, if you if you if you read online to other company stories, if Nokia, Kodak, whatever it is, it clearly shows that it doesn't matter how much uh, how successful you are. It's it definitely you have to uh, question your assumptions because it doesn't uh, stand. Uh, it's it's not how do you say that? It's not that you have the holy grail. It's a, it's a, it's not only the market changes, but eventually the way your company profits or uh, earns money and solves problems changes. I think. Yeah, I was just thinking there where you, where you when you were talking, we mentioned Kodak, which failed to reinvent itself. Fuji in Japan did manage to reinvent itself, so it was much more successful. In developing digital technology for you know for optical use, if you look at Facebook, for example, it, it's it's constantly stealing ideas from other people in order to update its theory of the business. Right, so it had this big breakthrough, and now it has to leverage its size and financial power in order to stay stay relevant. Yeah. The- so they bought Instagram, they bought WhatsApp, they you know, they're trying to, you know, develop Facebook Messenger, they're sort of trying to merge them all together now. Anything to keep the data coming in. And anything to could drive more more uh, ad revenue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And if you go back to the you know, the questions what's an organization actually paid for? Facebook leverages data, right? For for advertising or other purposes. You know, what, what is it considered to be meaningful? Well, it's supposed to be the idea of community, right? And communication, but you know, it often feels that that's subservient to, to the data, right? What's driving the organization is the need for data, <laughs> not a, a wider sort of mission. And, you know, where, define where an organization must excel in order to maintain leadership. It has to maintain its leadership in data acquisition, as well as the sort of user experience and, and the ability to bring people together well in my opinion they've lost uh, i don't remember anyone in these days that is using facebook to post their daily activities if they do i don't look at it exactly that's the second part of it uh, uh, why people are not using it anymore and the use i see for facebook now is is for you the news it's it's really fun in spreading news and that's the majority of people around me are using facebook for and and exactly like you said they're acquiring so many other companies use those tools to increase uh, the revenues of their cash cow which is the ads revenue So, so Drucker then goes on to say, well, what, what, what are you supposed to do when you perceive that your theory of the business isn't working anymore? And he says that the first thing that they do, that companies tend to do, is to defend themselves. And they typically do that by sticking their head in the sand and <laughs> trying to pretend that <laughs> nothing is happening. It's, uh, it's, it'll be fine next quarter or next year or the next reaction then is to patch it up, you know, and, and just sort of splice in bits and pieces and so on and so on. But he, he actually said that what you have to do is take preventative measures. There's only two of those. You either abandon your current theory of the business, so you actually really conduct an internal analysis. 
And then the second thing he's saying is that uh, to study what goes on outside the business. So you're reaching out into the wider environment you're, and you're looking at non uh, customers because most innovations don't happen inside your business. They happen outside in the wider environment and you need to be plugged in in that in order to find out what non customers are doing so you can actually uh, learn from them. And he gives the example of Walmart, which is a retail powerhouse in, in, in America. But even in its sort of 1990s heyday, it, it only had about 14% of the market. But actually, if they'd looked at non-customers, if they'd looked wider, they would see that, you know, the future was in, in Amazon. And now they're actually responding, right, to Amazon. They have their version of Amazon Prime and, and you know, rapid delivery and all that sort of stuff. Basically, they had to look at not the the 14% they are, were focused on, but on the 86% they weren't focused on, as why were are they not our customers, which Amazon did. Uh, the second reaction, he says, is to stop yourself from uh, becoming obsolete is what he calls early diagnosis. It's, it's bit paying attention to the warning signs and seeing where the, the change has actually happened. And he says, you know, this, this generally happens when you've got rapid growth. So the rapid growth doesn't mean that your theory of the business is fine and you should carry on. It means you should probably change and adapt. He talks about unexpected successes, which again is a reflection of the uh, non-customers, right? So you've acquired these this range of customers. You know why is that? If you if you can actually uh, understand that, a couple of examples there. So the first one, if you've got rapid growth in Airbnb, for example, if you go back to their original pitch deck, they they were offering you know rooms with locals instead of hotels. And once that had grown exponentially, their growth had to come from elsewhere and they've changed their mission statement now to belong anywhere, which allows them to do you know, trips and experiences. And, and then uh, Quibi, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. No, I'm not familiar with it. It's kind of Netflix, but for short stuff. So everything has to be 10 minutes long. 10 minutes long? Oh, wow. <laughs> It was started by an executive, his name, I can't remember, but he, he had an awful lot of experience. Okay. <laughs> and they raised $1.75 billion, and it turned out that nobody was interested in short form. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So you're saying that their their failure had to be uh, the sign for them the, to to <laughs> to to test their assumptions, to re, to review their assumptions. You know, they did it the old-fashioned way, right? I've got a big idea. I'm the executive. I've got I've got some money. This is going to be a success because I'm going to throw some money at it, right? Which is how um, studios traditionally worked. Correct. Yeah, that's definitely true. You know what they should have done was spend a few million pounds to see if the 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 value that they could create from that was something that people really really wanted, or spend no money at all and draw it out and go on the streets and ask people if they want to do it. <laughs> I did watch one or two of the uh, episodes of something I can't remember what it was, but it was like, well, what, why do I sit at home and watch a ten minute thing? The length should be the length it should be. It shouldn't be... The focus, yes, exactly. The focus is on, on small bites that I read here. I mean, your attention span will take care of the rest, right? <laughs> when I come at home, I want to see a movie. Then the, the, it doesn't matter for me how long the, the, the movie is. It's whether the movie is going to entertain me. If it's in 30 minutes, whether it's in 10 minutes, great job, uh, producer. <laughs> but the, the minutes itself it isn't of value for me, to be honest. Yeah, you sit down with your partner after dinner. Oh, let's watch something. Oh, did you enjoy that? It was only 10 minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. But the, what I find interesting is, this is interesting. You said You just said like the founder was really experienced. And what I find interesting is that this theory of business of Peter Drucker, he explained it so clearly and in such a simple way that I sometimes ask whether how it comes that those executives or those those individuals can who can collect more than a billion dollars uh, of funding, how come that they didn't know about 
to be flexible uh, about uh, with change, to understand change and what it means for businesses to change. It's like I, I, that 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 astonishes me. <laughs> well, so so I, it's Jeffrey Katzenberg, and he uh, was an executive for many years. But the one you probably heard of is DreamWorks. Yeah, but he also worked at Walt Disney. When you are executing a known business plan, right, that what, what tends to happen is that the people who know the most go to the top. Mm -hmm. right? So, so you, the, the expertise rises to the top. You, you're paid more because you know more, right? And that's the sort of industrial revolution model. You're, you're making yeah. widgets. The person who knows the most about widgets is the manager of the widget factory. Exactly. Right, who... who reports to the person who who owns the capital to to build the widget factory i mean that's how it works yeah true when you work in innovation you don't know you don't you, you, you've done it before right so you, who's the expert well the expert who is the person who can facilitate the exploration of the hypotheses that's going to prove your business case or or, or your business plan or whatever it is exactly so the the what what Jeffrey Katzenberg the you know the fundamental mistake was I'm executing what I know and he, and it turns out he wasn't because the 10 minute short form thing is different to a 90 minute animated movie with a business model based around uh cinema release DVD you know rental and you know or, or, or digital rental yeah, it's interesting that uh, if you're going to be an expert, you will you will probably grow on the hierarchical ladder of an organization, and eventually you will become an expert in a field. And Katzenberg was probably an expert in producing or or facilitating the production of movies or good animation, whatever it is, uh, DreamWorks and Paramount Pictures, the movies itself. And eventually, if he had a lot of successes in those. Uh, those companies as an executive, would he assume that he would find himself an expert in innovation within this industry? Would he uh, say such thing, such a thing like, I am uh, an expert in this field because I have led several companies uh, successfully, earned a lot of money for the companies, uh, made it so I've met the customer needs in, a, in the best way. Therefore, I'm going to, I have an idea and this idea is, is a good idea, which will probably lead to a lot of revenue because I'm an expert in a field. But exactly like you say, it's an innovation. It's completely a, something different and new. Well, the value proposition is completely different. You, you know, you, you go to the cinema, it's less about seeing a movie and more about spending quality time with your partner or your family, your friends. It's about relaxation or entertainment, entertainment right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, whereas a 10 minute short form thing, right? What's, well, what's the value proposition? It's not about spending quality time with your partner. It's certainly not about spending time with your friends, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's maybe a little bit entertaining. <laughs> and, yeah. But the, the fundamental mistake he's made is to think that they are the same value proposition. Exactly. What I, what I need to do is to be able to get enough money in order to create some content and that content gets actually distributed. And yeah, you even use some of the same channels to distribute it, but actually the, the driver uh, at the customer end, the environmental factors are, are totally different. Yeah, completely. And if I, if I, if you look at it in his career, the, the value proposition of probably Paramount pictures, Walt Disney studios, I read here, DreamWorks were, entertainment focused and 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 quibi was had a different value proposition without knowing his value proposition it was a new startup it was an innovation within the industry and therefore i can't see i don't see any experience which is aligned uh, experience which is aligned with the value proposition of quibi and and if he would have made another similar type of company like DreamWorks or Paramount Pictures, I would definitely, uh, I, I would assume he would be more successful than Quibi because he wasn't. Right. For example, yeah. 
1.75 billion pounds, I'm going to start up a new animation studio. And you'd be like, great. We can expect half a dozen great movies because that's your track record. Exactly. Uh, on the same value proposition. I mean, this is totally different. The fundamental confusion around it. Yeah, exactly. And he, this shows again that the Katzenberg had also created a new startup with the same assumptions. Right. <laughs> yeah. But it's just, but it's different. <laughs> Wrong assumption. It's completely the theory different. of the business. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, he plotted the theory of the business completely in a different, different. For, forgot he wasn't working in a in a traditional studio. Exactly. That's interesting. <laughs> it proves Drucker's point because he goes on and says that you know the cure for when you need to change the theory of the business is not to hire a genius suppose a genius or charismatic leader it's about hard work right it's about being clever it's about being conscientious it's what ceos are supposed to be paid for <laughs> exactly <laughs> and in katzenberg's days it's like i've clearly i, I don't doubt he worked very hard and, and very conscientiously but but he was uh working in the wrong direction which is you know the point that that Drucker is making with the theory of the business. Yeah, completely. He t exactly, this, this, the, exactly the case. Like he argues, uh, Peter, like the Cengiz Khan and the Leonardo da Vinci in the executive suite. And therefore, if I am the Cengiz Khan or the Leonardo da Vinci, and therefore I'm able to do also successfully new things. And I think Drucker says something like, you know, management or leadership, it, it's not based on what you know. It, you know that the, it's based on a different set of characteristics because it is based around these ideas of what's the theory of the business what are we getting paid for what what do people actually want what core competencies do we need to actually do those those are skills based on observation and analysis not on i know the most about x yeah definitely i agree with that and and he he also writes about the human part which he says that it's not exactly like the Leonardo da Vinci. It's about that organizations are interconnected with each other. As he says in the specifications that the assumptions about environment, mission, and core competence must fit reality. He's also said that the, the, all these uh, assumptions has to fit one another. And, and then and the specific mission of, the, of an organization, which is being carried by the whole, all the people within the organization has to, uh, be tested and it shows clearly that uh, his, with a historical example he gives at all the companies that it doesn't matter what our type of organization you have now and what type of solution or what type of problem you are solving now it whenever something changes you it, it sh they should understand that the organization as a whole has to respond and not the individual CEO at the top. The whole company is now solving a problem based on uh, several assumptions and the environment changes. Therefore, the whole company has to move towards those new uh, changes. And exactly the, the same case as Quibi or whatever, Kodak or whatever, the uh, IBM or all those other examples. The whole organization, certain the, the, the companies who were successful moved the whole organization. Companies who weren't those successful, like Nokia or Kodak, yeah, the executives, <laughs> they they had assumptions about the industry and therefore they didn't change the whole organization and therefore they were not the leaders anymore in the industry, in their industry. As you know, I work a lot in museums and trying to get museums to understand, A, the idea that they're a business, right? That the amount of money they bring in has to equal the amount of money, money they spend or they're in trouble, right? That's also a problem right from the start. But I've tried to explain to, to people in museums, if I want to find out about a subject, the last place I'm going to go to is a museum. The first place I'm going to go to is Google or YouTube or the last thing I'm going to do is I, I want to find out about the Romans. So I'm going to pop on my coat and I'm going to spend three hours in this museum and learn about some stuff, right, and see some objects, right? And people just don't get that. And what I keep saying is that the the idea of the museum, as we assume, 
was one that was established in the mid 19th century when state education wasn't available. So where do you go to find out about the Romans? You have to go to the museum because it's the only place you can you can do that. Nowadays, that's not the case. So you have to stop thinking of yourself as an encyclopedia and start thinking of yourself as, as something else. The, the challenge with museums is they've managed to convince themselves that they're special and that what happened in the 19th century is so special that it has to be paid for in the same way and delivered in the same model in the 21st century. Yeah, they have to reinvent the theory of business. It doesn't fit the reality, current reality. No, and, I, and I think that's why the theory of the business is so useful wherever you're working, because it's about how you interface with the external environment and then how you reconfigure yourself to create value within that environment. That's its its universal application or its its universal its universal benefit. A few years ago, I was uh, interested in a lot in mosques. When I went to the a local mosque in the city Arnhem in the Netherlands, I I visited the, uh, almost every night because I thought there was of some of value uh, there was value in it for the community around it for the community within the city and the majority of time they they would say mosque is the central place where people would uh, get their problems solved and and if they need any help they can come here if they need some uh, direction coaching training whatever it is and that attracted me and that motivated me to visit it and eventually while visiting it I never saw People at the same age, back then I was, I think, at 22, 23. At my age, I, w I wasn't seeing anyone visiting it or families. They weren't visiting it. Just They were only visiting it during uh, at the end of the Holy Month where we had to fast uh, and celebrate uh, the fasting, when we had to eat some sweets or something. Everybody was there. Or when we had some uh, party, <laughs> everyone would visit it. Um, but eventually... I started questioning it, uh, questioning uh, uh, the purpose of the mosque uh, with the elderly that were in charge of managing the mosque. And they weren't pleased. I said, look, guys, I remember exactly based on this theory of business. I, I said to them, what is the purpose of the mosque? They would say it's a, it's a place where people could pray. It's a place where people could, could solve problems. That would, I would question as an analyst. <laughs> yeah, I, I literally asked, okay, could you tell me how many problems and what type of problems you solved in the previous year? And, and they literally <laughs> weren't able to answer me. And eventually I... I, I thought I, I questioned them and I even proposed like guys, if we are telling people and asking them to donate money to our mosque to make it sustainable so that this place can exist, uh, therefore we have to think about uh, to give them something in return. If we are promoting the mosque as a place where they could solve their problems, let's just start with solving problems and let's just start giving it, uh, uh, start giving them. Uh, or facilitating the space for people so they can feel at ease if they have a problem to come to us or to come to the place. But eventually <laughs> it was written off and they didn't like <laughs> my comments or questions. And I, to be honest, I got demotivated. I got demotivated because they, because they want to have, uh, they want, they wanted to keep the same purpose. Uh, the mosque has the same purpose in the previous 1400 years and it still has the same purpose. Why it's, well, I believe when some organization, whether it's a mosque or a place, calls itself the central point of a community, then it has to serve the community. And it comes exactly uh, like the Peter says, uh, the theory of business had to be reevaluated. <laughs> I don't know what it's like historically in the Netherlands or indeed, you know, in the Middle East and and how mosques were used. But in in Britain, for example, um, historically, churches did solve people's problems so that they, they would, because they were pretty much self-sufficient, they had to be self-sufficient, yeah. right? They would grow produce and they would sell it. So there was a sort of market there. They would also provide welfare. Right, so if you were unemployed, not that we technically had unemployment, but if you were poverty stricken, 
you know, several hundred years ago, you, you would actually go to the church and the, and the church would help support you. Exactly. And obviously they did very important record keeping, um, you know, births, deaths, marriages, and, you know, all that mm-hmm. sort of um, bureaucracy. And, and it's just that much of that uh, has been centralized, you know, as the, as the nation state has evolved. And the and the government apparatus has has actually improved. The point still stands, right? Is that well? What am I supposed to get now from a religion or or a church community? Exactly. It does raise some interesting questions about if you think of um, the the hierarchy of needs. So who did that? Maslow. So the so Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, so the, so the nature of religion is that it doesn't need to provide the food stuff anymore. Although, I mean, arguably could do, I suppose, but but not in the same scale. It, it, as you move up that that hierarchy of needs, well, it's not not providing shelter, right, or safety, or you know, actually, how are you helping with the top model of self actualization? I think that's what you're getting towards and i suppose self-actualization in that context is about a thriving community and i guess your point is that they're not sufficiently well tuned uh, to be a with the external environment to realign themselves exactly know. they're still tuned on the assumptions um they have been taught or they had about mosques and initially, the mosque had the same purpose, like you explained about the churches. Back then, when Marx mosques were um, started, uh, uh, were created in the Middle East by the Arab people, and they 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 were they had a purpose to serve people, to make them literate, to make them read uh, the holy book, and make them help them uh, to give them welfare, give them food, help them to jobs, and etc. etc. But that purpose, well, that doesn't that's not the case anymore in the mosque in the Netherlands I see it's more purpose is like bringing people because of the religion uh, because they're praying because they have the value of uh, praying while I s- clearly believe that the theory of business should also <laughs> <laughs> well you're moving beyond the rituals right I guess probably the my, kind of my frustration with religion is that actually the, the rituals don't help solve my serious problems right that that's exactly. you know uh, uh, getting off the topic really but you know but again it, it does come back to that well what's your fundamental purpose how are you, how are you enabling or or what value are you creating for for a wider community or what assumptions you you approach a particular religion what assumptions based on what assumptions are you following a religion and exactly like you said uh uh also, uh, with me in my personal case, I used to assume that if I, the more I prayed, the more I would be able to have a successful startup. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you can, but you have to do the work as well. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Assumptions. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the most interesting things I saw during the pandemic is probably going on still was. Uh, a small museum in New York. I can't remember what it's called. It's an art gallery. And of course they had to close during the early stages of the pandemic. But what they did was that they used their space to collect and distribute food parcels to the local community. Oh, wow. you know, so, so, the, <laughs> so for, you know, maybe they won't do it permanently, but maybe they will. I don't know. But um, th- what they did do was realign with the, with the environment. And say, well, this is this is what the environment needs. This is the value that sort of customers are looking for. We have some core competences that match that. And for this amount of time, we're prepared to um, reinvent ourselves uh, to support the local community. Yeah, that's interesting what you said. Like the art gallery, uh, it would be interesting to understand their thought process. Like <laughs> the art gallery is going to close. It's the pandemic. Everything is going in quarantine or lockdown. And suddenly they probably thought about, okay, our purpose is to provide art pieces or information about art pieces to people, to inspire them. Okay, that the environment is changing. How could we change to meet the 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 changing needs of people in the, within their environment and people would literally like you said in the during the pandemic around the world people would would focus only on food and their job and and basic needs basically 
So it's beautiful how to see how the art gallery <laughs> repurposed them by by questioning their assumptions about their assumptions, which were based, questioning their purpose based on the assumptions they had, like the art gallery is the art gallery, therefore we are going to stay art gallery. No, we're going to change based on the changing environment. People need food. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's a very that's a product of probably some very insightful leaders who who recognise that the purpose of culture is beyond culture. It, it touches on a on a on a deeper human need in some way, in order to uh, bring communities together, shared beliefs, shared values, or whatever. And actually, the the imminent need within that community is not to you know, be socially controlled by going through the art gallery and being told about the importance of modern art. You know, it was like, well, we've got struggling families, or, uh, and the best way to serve them is because our space is in the middle of the community and what they really need is, is, you know, nourishing of the body rather than of the soul during this particular period of time. Well, you mentioned leadership and I'm curious during this situation, the, the pandemic situation, how would it look like if uh, organizations uh, which are now closed would understand the theory of business and would question their assumptions, try to change and uh, change according to the environment. That would be interesting if they were using this, if they could use this theory of business. How would it would look like then? I mean, I suppose for most businesses, I don't know, or for a proportion of businesses, they're, they're trying to adapt as well as they can. They're doing instinctively. They may not have had workshop sessions and so on and so on. They probably worked it out as they went along, right? I think what's what's been interesting for me to to watch this kind of wider museum community is that the first response was, "We're special, we're culture. You've got to give us some money, or we won't be able to sustain ourselves." Right? Which I suppose is fair enough. Yeah. What's been much slower to evolve is a a deeper understanding of how culture can play a role when you're not able to visit a museum or an art gallery. The digital responses have been, I'm just going to film this person walking around the gallery giving a tour. <laughs> and the, the basic assumption is that people are sitting there at home thinking, I really want to go to an art gallery and have a tour. They're probably not. They're thinking of something probably quite different. Uh, they probably want distractions. They perhaps want something that encourages greater reflection because people have been reflecting more deeply, I think, during the pandemic. They're not thinking about a community thing where, well, how can we bring people's voices together and let's do a dynamic tour where we, people can vote on it or they can give suggestions. And again, a sign that we really need to think intelligently and deeply about this theory of the business rather than I know the most about and therefore, that's what we're going to going to do. And, and the pandemic has exposed that, that the people who have succeeded during the pandemic are those that really have shown a deeper understanding of the environment and the widening of the customers and aligned their value propositions around that. And then the competencies come to, to actually support that. I definitely. I, I think this, this theory could benefit not only corporate companies, but also small entrepreneurs, small local shops to reinvent them like the art gallery had did. I remember during the start of the pandemic that an ice cream uh, seller in the Netherlands started changing his uh, business completely into a uh, hand soap business because he said <laughs> the demand of hand soap is, is exploding. So I have the machines. I'm going to repurpose it for hand soap. <laughs> that was interesting. And it's definitely, I agree, that the the environmental changes in now, especially the pandemic, forces people to think about new revenue streams. But without uh, the the pandemic, people like like Peter Drucker says, even if you're successful, it's definitely beneficial to to test your assumptions again to to understand whether you can stay sustainable or not, financially sustainable or not. And definitely a recommendation for anyone. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we look at some of the bigger examples, I made a few notes. Uh, Microsoft Windows is a, is a really good example of how they've 
reinvented their theory of the business several times. So in the early days, they just provided the operating system, right, the, the, to the IBM PC clones. Then they developed Windows. And then they decided that everything had to be through Windows. So, so you had to access the internet through Windows. And the, you know, the Xbox runs on a Windows platform. And they tried Windows phones, and it turned out that nobody wanted Windows phones uh, and actually, what's happened in the last few years is, is Satya Nadella, the, the you know the current chief executive, has shifted from. It's not about Windows as a platform; mm-hmm. it's about enabling people to do more. Which means it doesn't really matter about Windows so much. It's about cloud. It's about how can you leverage the power of the cloud, and that's the sort of direction that they're actually moving into. Yeah. And it's interesting if you track how he coped with. I guess, turning off the Windows phone. He didn't just come in and say, oh, I'm scrapping that. He he actually allowed them to fail. You know, that division, he said, well, prove it. Uh, and and it, it, they didn't. It is not what, not what the market wanted. Uh, and so that sort of empowered him. And he has a very mature response, I think. Another one, uh, Google, you know, has transitioned from Google to Alphabet. So it went from... Yeah, a mission statement around ordering the world's information and selling advertising. Now they've transitioned to Alphabet, this sort of company which which stretches across that. Which means that Google itself just focuses on on the web search, the advertising. That's really it, wow. and then the rest comes from a, a wider base, which is about empowering entrepreneurs and and empowering business. And the other one I put there is around um, IKEA. So it's not just about flat pack furniture. They have a, a democratic design process. And so they they try and bring things together under a combination of function, form, quality, sustainability, and low price. I don't know if there's any other examples you can think of. What is interesting about IKEA is IKEA start, uh, is, is has the, the same theory of business since their start, right? Pretty much, yeah. It's interesting to to look up uh, the way they started because it probably is that they have thought about the industry itself, how they currently on on based on what and based on which type of theory of business the current industry operates, and they will probably test those assumptions and eventually like the environment is changing, the theory of business and within the within this industry is 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 completely something else. So and therefore they have created eventually the dem- democratic design as their uh, as their focus, which is completely aligned with the current needs of the of, of the environment. Obviously, because they are growing still. <laughs> he was a bit of an odd character, the, the the guy who started it. He was responding to the environment. You know, he's a furniture maker, and he was like, "Well, I can sell that cheaper if." you allow me to do it in a flat pack format. I mean, he didn't call it flat pack format at the time, but he was like, well, I'll sell it to you if you want to stick the legs on this table. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I suppose what what becomes more explicit is the idea of Swedish design, which again reflects the Swedish mentality around equality and the sort of lack of hierarchy within the country and, and so on and so on. Obviously, I can say this because I'm Swedish. Right. IKEA is a reflection of that. And actually, over time, IKEA has has evolved in very subtle ways. So to address the sustainability issues, for example, they they make products out of the waste from other products that they're making. Yeah, that's really good. And then they also recognize that their particular combination is open to perhaps not competition, but to take over. And so they've, they're have they actually constituted in a very odd way as a not-for-profit in the Netherlands. You can't go and buy shares in IKEA, is the point. Yeah, exactly. Well, it definitely fits in the current reality that more and more businesses, organizations, it needs to be sustainable. They have even, they, they even plant their own trees. They have their own tree productions. So, so from the whole chain uh, of their uh, of their operations and their whole operations chain, they keep their assumptions aligned, like Peter Drucker says. You know what? What's 
so what? Right? How did how is this relevant for business? In my opinion, it's definitely relevant. Why? Because every business is uh, has a mission, has a particular set of products, services, has a particular mission which they promotes internally outside of the companies. Uh, and which is based on particular assumptions of maybe a group of executives or historical uh, mission they have, which is based on the group of people who created the company. So I think, I think it's definitely relevant to understand the theory of business and try to test their assumptions because factually environments change, customer needs change, the needs of people change, markets change. Everything is, uh, uh, the human nature changes constantly. Therefore, it's definitely crucial for an organization to, based on this theory of business, to look at their assumptions and look to their internal operations. And like Peter Drucker said, like to the markets, all those disciplines, dimensions, departments, people who are related to the organization, look to all those assumptions and try to test it, whether it meets the current reality, in my opinion. What do you think? Uh, when you were talking there, I was just thinking of one of the ongoing debates within the museum sector is about relevance. That has come about because what has happened is the, is really the slow privatization of culture. Right. So it used to be funded by the state. You write a check every year. Here's what we're going to deliver. And the fundamental assumption of that is that culture is good. We believe it's good for the public to know about culture. Culture. We believe it's so good for the public to know about culture that we'll pay for it out of taxation. That's a set of assumptions. And actually, what's happened, um, you know, since the financial crisis, and arguably a bit before, but but especially since the financial crisis is the government's like, yeah, we can't afford that. Like you're on increasingly you're on your own. The solution to that is relevance. If you are working in the private sector as you, as you currently have to within the museum sector, you have to generate your own income. The assumptions that I just stated about our oh, culture is a good idea and we're going to pay for it. Da, da, no longer are the same because what you're asking people to do is to hand over their time their money, their attention, in order to engage with culture. <laughs> that trickles through this idea of relevance. So what, what are you actually paid for? Well, just telling people about culture is not enough. Yeah. I so so well, what, is, what does that actually mean? Well, how, how, you, how does that affect your idea of success? And therefore, in order to deliver that idea of success, what expertise do you need within the organization or the museum in order to deliver that? So what you see is a slow transition now from traditional curatorial experts into more, more production-based experiences because that's more engaging, it's more entertaining, and I think the next stage then is about, well, how, how can culture deliver greater benefits for people? How does it play a bigger role in your life? In the same way that you were talking about the mosque, I think that's the same for all traditional sort of public sector organizations. To justify their ex ongoing existence, you have, to, you have to create a much wider value that's of, of meaning to to your customers or to your audiences uh, within, a, you know, within a museum. For me, the importance of of the theory of the business then is that if you introduce that to a management team, right, you're cutting through a lot of the crap about um, about the assumptions that existed in the past, and you're actually saying, well, if you know, what, what's the assumption? Well, culture is good. How do we know that? Well, the government gives us money for us for for it to. Well, do you know what? Is that still true? Well. Oh, you know, not really, you know, or if it is true, there's less money available. So therefore, what value do we have to create in order to access it? And so for me, the, the relevance of the theory of the business is that first stage of strategic conversations serves to unify 
the discussion and really flush out what is what is really important yeah exactly and i recognize in your in your uh, take off the business the theory of business i i recognize the process of what uh, mark and spencer's had of eight years changing the complete environment uh the assumptions of the all oh, the whole environment so what you're talking about i think is not only within the museum that the, the questioning the assumptions the testing the assumptions but also the government all those parties around it the people itself everyone questioning the assumptions of about museums the purpose of it and to change that if well, i would i would imagine like okay if museums tomorrow would say right this is our new purpose people would like to be entertained with museums and if the people the the the, the visitors wouldn't uh, involved within this change process and the government and all those other parties, would it be successful, this change? Obviously so not. Is... <laughs> no, exactly. So I think definitely one of other lessons I take from this theory of business is, is in certain industries, within certain organizations, it would definitely take time. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And, absolutely. And for example, in, in the company I work in currently, in the telecom company, uh, where we are responsible for um, installation and and of fiber optics cables for uh, telecom providers, a change in assumptions it's it's much more difficult. It's it takes a lot of time because it's it's based on this historical assumptions how people would operate, how organizations should operate. Definitely an important lesson: the time it takes to change those assumptions, to challenge those assumptions. It doesn't matter, right, if you're in the public sector or the private sector or charity sector or whatever. What you have is, is is a number of resources, a number of competencies that you apply to those resources in order to create some sort of value for the customer. Yeah, right. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you're in a museum. It's still the same. We've got some objects. We've got some expertise. We're leveraging those together to create an experience for people, right? It's exactly the same as um, in a manufacturing capacity. I have some resources. I have some expertise. I'm leveraging those together to create uh, a computer or, you know, watch or whatever it is. It's still exactly the same. You know, the really important point then is that it's no longer just about that expertise or that resources. The theory of the business pushes you to really think, that only applies within a certain set of assumptions in the wider environment. Exactly. It's not anymore about the how only. No, no. It really is about the what. If you think about it personally, I, I in my in my experience, I've lived for several years with several. I live now with current currently with a lot of assumptions. But before this, a previous uh, in the last few years, I changed a lot of assumptions. But it took time. It took several years to to get rid of a lot of assumptions which i took for granted comes down to the human again which uh, needs to test their assumptions whether it's in the organization or outside it that's also the so what about for individuals if you're still talking about your career or something like that it it, it still comes back to those sort of same three things yeah it's it's basically i see it like the environment the second one your own life's purpose and the, the third one which competencies you need to achieve your life's purpose and it's definitely make me question like in a personal environment how would this theory of business like reinventing yourself when the outcome isn't as you wished would they change their assumptions like okay assumed that these this is the direction or these are the steps i had to take to achieve my goal and eventually it didn't work out would they start thinking about their assumption or would they question their failure itself? Like, why was it failure? I did exactly like other people. Well, definitely a, 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 a must read. <laughs> definitely a recommended article for anyone who wants to learn about, I think, strategy and what domains see. It's a human insight. It's human creativity. And it, what he said about himself was that he used a common sense approach, but that's actually why it was so rare because most people don't use common sense. So, yeah. 
But he did say, look, what I do is I, I, you know, symbolically, I suppose, metaphorically, you open the window, you look out, you sit and note what you've seen. You then analyze what you've seen. You, you look for the bigger messages, the bigger theories, the sort of bigger patterns. Yeah, definitely. And besides that, it was an interesting uh, perspective towards uh, innovation or strategy or the repurposing of an organization. Definitely a, a, a recommended uh, article. Hi, Alex here. I'm back to close out this episode of the Innovation Book Club with a few prompts and questions to take your learning further. Before we start, however, here's a quick note about why we're actually doing this. We believe that the value of learning is not in knowledge acquisition. Its value lies in the reflection process. When you judge the value of the knowledge that you've been exposed to, you understand how that analysis changes your view of the world and then ultimately how that knowledge and understanding increases both your capacity and capability to engage with and shape the world around you. So to that end, what we've done is we've come up with a few questions to help you reflect on what you've just heard and to try and push you on with your own innovation learning journey. So here they are. Number one, what is the theory of the business for the organization you're currently working in? Number two, in your opinion, what are the assumptions your organization gets right and gets wrong? Third, and finally, what are you working on fruitlessly? These questions are also in the podcast notes together with additional links if you'd like to read or watch something else related to this episode. Good luck with your answers and let us know how you get on. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Innovation Book Club. If you've enjoyed this episode, then you can do three things to help us grow our audience. First of all, please leave us a five-star review on your podcatcher of choice. This helps to feed the algorithm. Second, share this episode with your friends and colleagues if you think they would benefit. And finally, if you'd like to listen to all future episodes of the Innovation Book Club as soon as they're available, then please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. In the meantime, take care and we'll be back soon. Mm-hmm.